So I want to welcome everyone here. My name is Vicki Yamasaki, founder and chair of Corpus Christi for Unity and Peace. I also want to welcome those that are participating across our nation and frankly across the world, our national uh, members as well that obviously cannot be here physically in this room. I'm going to make a few introductory comments before we get into our program. Voices Crying Out in the Desert, featuring Father John Lovell, who is the co-founder for the Coalition for Cancel Priests. I want to thank everyone for coming with obviously special thanks to Father Lovell and Father Scott Duvall and David Avignoni of the Coalition for Cancel Priests for making their way to the Hoosier State. You can applaud. <laughs> oh. Honestly, please pray for these guardian angels that are protecting and supporting courageous priests. CUP's mission is to inspire Catholics to uphold and promote a culture that safeguards the dignity of every human person, and this includes cancel priests. Yes, yes. Our pillars of focus are the sanctity of life, the sanctity of marriage, and religious liberty. And this is undergirded by the preservation of natural law and protecting our re democratic republic, which sadly, I must state, is in real jeopardy, as we have seen with what travesty has passed the Senate last week which is nothing protecting marriage, but will strip us all of our religious liberties. Amen? Amen. And we un understand that we desperately need priests, don't we, that will speak truth and preserve the doctrine of our faith so that, so that we will save the church, right? Because if we don't save the church, we do not save the culture. We believe that promoting truth through education and prayer will indeed save the church and the culture. But this is why we support these priests. Because we have wonderful programs like these with speaking events. In fact, we've had several priests that have in fact been supported by the Coalition for Cancel Priests as keynote speakers at our CUP events. The program tonight, Voices Crying Out in the Desert, is part of our educational mission of CUP. We selected these guardians of courageous, truthful priests who help to inspire and bring support, both financially and spiritually, to those clerics that have been the victims of this cancel culture. In this world, priests are canceled for speaking out against the unorthodoxy of Novus Ordo masses where, frankly, anything can go. There are some great ones out there, but we've seen in cupcake land where it's just a travesty. But they can't speak out, just like they can't speak out on the homosexual scourge in our nation or the priestly sex abuse crisis or even closer to home in Carmel, Indiana, for which why, why we even founded CUP, you can't speak out on the evil snares of Black Lives Matter Worldwide Foundation leadership, because if you do, you'll be canceled by a bishop. Without such priests who are in the front line of the battle, I'm telling you, we will lose. So having the Coalition for Cancel Priests to support these courageous, truthful priests and help them restore their priestly faculties, what do we have? It is of paramount importance that we have this organization and support them. We're, you're in for a treat. He's standing in the wings here. Father Scott Duvall, who's actually the priestly assistance coordinator with the Coalition for Cancel Priests, is going to open us in prayer and offer his own story before you hear from our featured presenter tonight, Father John Lovell. Now, Father Scott Duvall hails from Harrisburg, Illinois, and is a priest of the Diocese of Rockford, Illinois. And he, guess what? He is actually a convert to the faith from being a missionary Southern Baptist. 
Wow. I mean, wow. So let's give a warm cup welcome to Father Duvall. Thank you very much. It is an honor to be here. So let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. O oh God, by your holy prophets, you promised that your only Son would come in the flesh for us and be born of a virgin. In these last days, you have fulfilled your word when he who came to redeem the world comes to be our judge. Let us not be put to shame. And Lord God Almighty, when we have seen our last tomorrow, send us a priest to anoint and absolve us and send us to you through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the, name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So I am Father Duvall, the Priestly Assistance Coordinator for the Coalition. Now what that means is when a priest applies for help, he gets to hear my wonderful voice first. So I take the applications. I start the application by sending it to the due diligence team. It's an investigation team. They go through about six references. They go through the priest paperwork. They go through uh, the uh, stories. They go through social media. They go through everything to make sure that this is a loyal Orthodox priest. And when I say Orthodox, a real Catholic priest, okay? That his teachings are on point, that there's been no crime, and that he is canceled unjustly. And in that then, when that has been proven, that priest then can be helped with canon law fees, civil attorney fees, dentist bills, car repair, all those types of things because people like you, who are tired of losing their favored priests. People like you have been so generous and donated because the bishops have stopped taking care of the priests. Now, you've been giving money to your parishes and to the diocese because you want your priests taken care of. But if that job is not being done anymore, you've said, no, I'm going to put my money where they're going to take care of my priests. So Father's going to talk a, a bit more about that, and I was asked to also give a little Lenten uh, thought here. And uh, I, did I say, yeah, thank you. I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's start with this, just a little golden thought. Advent, or what is called in Latin Adventus, Originally, during the Roman Empire, Adventus meant escort or the glorious entry. And it was the ceremony that was held when the Roman emperor visited a city. The glorious entry. Also, it would be for his dignitaries that came from there. The imperial Adventus was that period's... Mm, ceremonial par excellence. That was the blessing upon that city for that when that emperor had visited. Now, as the church in its brilliance and its excellence always does, she took those things of the world and then turns them into the things that turns our minds toward God and a desire for holiness. So now we have, since about the 4th century A.D., and that's A.D., ad dominum, no, there's no such thing as B, uh, B.C.E. and C.E., okay? Before common era and common era, well, what's the commonality? It's the birth of Christ is the commonality, okay? So since the 4th century A.D., the Sunday nearest the Feast of St. Andrew the Apostle has been the first Sunday of Advent. And because it can fall anywhere through that week, then, that's why there are different uh, amount of days in each year, of, in Advent on each year. So Advent, called then the Little Lent, is the preparation time. And you say, well, preparing for what? Well, the quick answer is the coming 
of the Christ child. But I'm going to give you just something, uh, um, maybe just a little extra thought here. For, the, for a deeper way to enter into Advent, it is the preparation of our bodies and souls for growing our desire for holiness and increasing in disdain for sin and worldly pleasure. In Advent, we should be fasting. <laughs> that was not the response I was looking for. <laughs> in fasting, it teaches us to control ourselves in a greater way. Self-control aids us in obtaining the virtue of fortitude. The virtue of fortitude, which is the moral virtue that ensures firmness in difficulties and constancy in the pursuit of the good. It strengthens the resolve to resist temptations. Then with us, growing in self-control, we then, with more ease, begin the process of working toward frequent good and full confessions. Confession is something that we should be doing and preparing for Christmas in Advent. Confession of when the most humble thing you can do the most humble thing you can do is when you grab hold of that door handle and open it up and step in. You have committed yourself to become more holy. Now, here's a little. I'm going to call on YouTube right here. You ready? Okay. How often are Catholics required to go to confession? You're right. Want to finish it? You want to finish a little more? Unless you realize. Very good. Got it. Very good. That is exactly, exactly right. So we are called, when we recognize that we're in a state of mortal sin, that we are to go to confession before you receiving Holy Communion. Exactly right. As soon as possible. But here's a little extra. It is called a devotional confession or an optional confession. Now, the devotional confession is a confession where you don't have mortal sin, but you go to confession and you confess sorrow for venial sins and you confess sorrow for past sins so that you get the absolution and the graces that pour forth from that absolution. Now, here's the little trick. You then can take those graces and offer them to God for another, for someone else. In this practice, I have seen minds and hearts changed. I have watched children return, wayward children return to the family. I have watched children return to practice of the faith. Devotional confession. Now, you say, well, wait a minute, what, what do I get out of this? I need grace too. Well, dear family, you have been given the gift of the graces. And you decide that you're going to sacrifice in a greater way and use that for somebody else's good? Uh, that's called sacrifice. And when you sacrifice, you become more holy. You become more Christ-like, more Christian. I always check on my facts when I write these things. <clears throat> and I was looking, doing some searching. I found a wonderful article on it. Does anybody know Raymond D'Souza? <laughs> he, he wrote a wonderful article on this, and you can look it up, Google it, whatever you want to do. But 
It is another tool, another weapon that we can use to get our families back together. And when I mean back together, I mean back in the house and back in the same church, back together. So dear family in Christ, let us prepare in a better way. Let us prepare for the Christ child with a pure heart and a cleansed soul. So come, let us adore him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Duvall. Wasn't that beautiful? And, you know, I, 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 how many of you understood that you could offer your devotional confession for another soul? Show of hands. Because, frankly, I go all the time because I'm such a sinner. And I did not know that. And now we could be offering this for our wayward children, but also for priests, you know, that have honestly really fallen away from that path that they should be pursuing. So praise be to God for, for that uh, witness. Thank you so much, Father Duvall. So Father Lovell is standing in the wings. Father Lovell is originally from the south suburbs of Chicago. He was ordained in the Diocese of Rockford, Illinois in 2007 by Bishop Thomas Duran. Father studied at Mount Mary Seminary where he was ordained and with the Masters in Dogmatic Theology. In 2012, while Father was studying at the Dominican House of Studies, sadly, he was removed, you can call it canceled, sidelined by the new Bishop of Rockford, David Malloy. For the last decade, Father Lovell has fought for his good name and has helped so many other priests in the same situation. In the spring of 2021, he co-founded the Coalition for Cancel Priests. So God uses this suffering and what he's done now with Father Lovell is Father Lovell is now a bastion of hope, isn't he? For so many priests. So more information can be found for everybody that's watching this live on YouTube, cancelpriests.org, canceled priest.org and that's one l canceledpriest.org please give a warm cup welcome to father john lovell thank you everyone so much and uh vicky thank you for inviting me we first met last april in charlotte and we weren't in the same room um Vicki was unfortunately having to deal with a migraine headache. And when I was a kid, I had to deal with, thank you for adjusting that. I had to deal with migraine headaches as well as had, my mother had to deal her life with migraine headaches. And so I know how horrible of a condition that it can be. But I, I do have to mention, because Vicki said at the beginning, let's, let's welcome the Coalition for Canceled Priests with a great, Hoosier welcome and one of my best friends went to uh, Purdue so he would be the first to say uh, remind them that Indiana is a boilermaker state <laughs> and I said well I don't quite know the difference between a Hoosier and a boilermaker and he said people in Indiana are born Hoosiers and some the elect he said by the grace of God become boilermakers and as you can tell we have some boilermakers in the house and that is wonderful to see um, before I begin my talk I would like to remind everyone here you do have and everyone watching uh, but those that are here you do have a little postcard in front of you of save the date our second annual conference which will be in Rosemont, Illinois. Um, I've been telling our executive director, David Avignone, to get the tickets on sale as soon as possible because they would make a great Christmas present for those. And m probably everyone in this room knows what Rosemont, Illinois is. It's O'Hare. And so oftentimes we get people say, well, is that in Chicago? I don't want to go to Chicago. It's unsafe. No, it's in Rosemont. The mob is going to take very good care of us. <laughs> 
we're going to be very safe in Rosemont, Illinois. We do not need to worry about that. But we have a great lineup of speakers. Uh, John Henry Weston is one of our keynotes, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, Jesse Romero, Janet Smith, just to name a few. And uh, I highly recommend to come because we get, pro this is probably our biggest gathering of the canceled priests. We try to get the canceled priests together twice a year. Once for kind of more of a private get together. I hate calling it a retreat because it's not really a retreat. It's a get together. And we're doing that in January. And then all the priests, and you see it on your postcard, uh, get together for the conference. And it's great for the priests to see as much of the laity as possible from across the country come out because it shows us what great support that we have. All right. And I realize that we're fighting. Uh, tonight, I shouldn't say fighting, that's too negative a word. We're competing with the Indiana uh, Right to Life dinner. But to be honest with you, I am still in awe of how many people came out today, and I appreciate that so much. And I also want to remind everyone that we did put a, a, a Coalition for Canceled Priests pin at every table. The two or three spots did not get one because we ran out, but... If you notice, we do have a couple of empty chairs. So if you did not get a pin, look for one of those empty chairs. There's probably a pin there. There's also one pin that lost the backing to it. <laughs> if you have that pin, I did have a bag with the pin backing by my chair, but it was taken away. Uh, I'm hoping David Avignone has it uh, so we can get you a backing. But either way, we'll make sure that you get a pin. With that said, I would like to read for you one of my favorite gospel passages that I would like to start my talk with tonight, and it is the gospel from Matthew for the second Sunday of Advent. At that time, when John had heard in prison of the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples to say to him, Are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answering said to them, Go and report to John what you have heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead rise, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not scandalized in me. Then as they went away, Jesus began to say to the crowds concerning John, what did you go out into the desert to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Behold, those who wear soft garments are in the houses of kings. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my angel before your face, who shall make ready your way before you. Now I'd like to ask all of you this. What word stood out the most in that gospel passage? See. What did you see? And you have to ask yourselves, what do you see when you see a priest of Jesus Christ? I hope that you see a man who's given up his life in order to serve you. I hope you see a man that is willing to die for you, as any good father would. That's one of the reasons why we call priests father. But we're speaking tonight, and I know at least for the last couple of months, you've had several canceled priests speak here for CUP, as well as Father Altman and Father Maldsley, both very good friends of mine. Father Altman, in fact, helped start the Coalition for Canceled Priests and is one of our biggest donors. And I want you to realize the importance of having a priest in your life. And that will be made clear, especially when I do the closing prayer tonight, which is the prayer on the back of the card that you have in front of you, the Holy Card of St. John Vianney. We were told in 2020 that we basically did not need priests anymore. 
It wasn't that direct when they said it, but this is how many of the bishops said it. You don't need to go to Mass. You don't need to receive Holy Communion. You don't need to go to confession. You don't need to receive anointing of the sick, despite the fact that, according to them, we had a devastating illness rampaging the country and the world. You even had some bishops and one cardinal, the Archbishop of Chicago, say that even emergency baptisms could not happen without his explicit permission. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone in this room is a minister of baptism in an emergency, and you have an obligation to do it, no matter what a priest, a bishop, a cardinal, or a pope says. Because first and foremost, we have to realize that the ministers of the church bring the sacraments to the people. And what happened in 2020 is that we were told that the sacraments were non-essential. That the priesthood was non-essential. And so when you couple that with what happened with the McCarrick scandal in the summer of 2018, rightly called the summer of shame, we started to see across the country laity finally standing up and saying enough is enough we are not going to allow this to happen anymore to our church we're tired of seeing our parishes closed we're tired of seeing consolidations happening we're tired of seeing our money go to democratic causes through the usccb you heard a lot about that from another good friend of mine michael hitchborn last month we want the faith of our fathers. We want the faith that Father Marquette, that Father Mazzucchelli brought to the Midwest. We do not want another organization that is simply out there being some type of charitable organization, at least as a front, and supporting causes that go against our basic beliefs. And the Coalition for Cancelled Priests decided that it was going to take after Our Lady as its primary patron, St. John the Baptist, because he was that voice that was crying in the wilderness. He was that voice that was crying in the desert and we took as you can see on your pins for our motto those with one voice crying in the desert those with one voice crying in the desert una voce clamantes in deserto and I have to ask you right now are you willing to be able to stand up to the wickedness that is happening on all the levels of the church and to realize that despite all of that wickedness, that we can see the hope and the wonder that is Jesus Christ our Lord? Father Duval rightly mentioned Advent, or as he likes to call it, Lent, <laughs> as a penitential season, and it is. In a few minutes, a good friend of mine, Matthew Pleasy, will be coming up to speak on that. But we have to remember the importance of Advent. It is not a preparation in remembering the first coming of our Lord. Advent is a reminder to us to live up to a line often forgotten by us that we say every Sunday. Ad expecto, resurrectionum mortuorum. And I watch 
for the resurrection and the life of the world to come. How many of you watch for Christ? Not remembering his first coming at Bethlehem. How many of you, as Father Duval mentioned, prepare yourself every Sunday, preferably every day, to receive our Lord in the most blessed sacrament? That's his first and second coming. How many of you, when you wake up, your first thoughts are to that final coming? that wonderful coming, when all injustice is swept away and Christ who ascended into heaven on a cloud comes back down the exact same way to pass judgment on the world, to truly take his place as king. He's king now. But how many of us do that day in and day out and have our complete focus on that. How many of us watch? Let's go even a little deeper than that. Most of us say the Nicene Creed at least every Sunday. I hope many of us say it at least once a day. But let's look at a prayer that is even closer to our hearts, the prayer that Christ himself gave us, the Lord's Prayer. And in that wonderful part when he says, Adveniat renium tuum, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Is that our constant petition? Is that our constant intercession? Or do we worry about what's going on in this world? Do you want to know that something that I find so amazing is that the canceled priests, and we try to do meet and greets across the country, when we have our conference, as we did last June and as we will do this June, we will have so many people come up to us, and they'll say to us, Father, whether it's Father Duval or Father Altman or Father Clay Hunt or Father Maldsley, they'll all say the same thing to us. You, know, you might be canceled, but you look so happy. Why is that? And I want to kind of turn the question around and say, well, why aren't you happy? Because no matter what grave things can happen to us, no matter what they might throw at us, no matter what that they may do to us, they might throw us to the lions, they might try to crucify us. Should we not rejoice in that and watch for his coming? Should we not proclaim when they do that to us, adveniat renium tuum, thy kingdom come, and say, Lord, you shed your blood for me, let me share my blood for you. There's something very interesting in this gospel passage that I read to you. Many people, especially the modern biblical scholars, will tell you that, well, John the Baptist started to doubt whether or not his cousin, who he recognized when he was still in the womb, might not actually be the person that we're coming for. But to be honest with you, if you look very deep into the back and forth, John and Jesus are teaching their disciples and us something very important. What John is saying and what John is asking is not how we interpret it. I know how hard that might be because it seems pretty clear. But really what John is saying is, I heralded your coming in this life. I know I'm about to die. I am about to be martyred. Am I to go into the netherworld? Am I to go into purgatory and to limbo where all the saints of the Old Testament are waiting for the resurrection to proclaim your coming even there? 
And notice what Christ says. Go back and tell John this. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead rise. I get a little frustrated when people say, well, if we look at all the liturgical seasons throughout the year, Advent and Christmas are the most alike. In one sense, yes. In another sense, no. Advent is preparing us for that general resurrection. Advent is preparing us when he comes again and when we rise. Are we ready to do that? That is why Advent is a penitential season. And at times it might be very easy for us to think that these are the worst times that the church has ever gone through. And can I tell you something right now? It just might be. It just might be. Today we celebrate the feast of St. Nicholas, a man who took fasting very seriously, a man who became bishop in Turkey, was known for his generosity, was known for his charity, was known for radiating Christ. He was a true bishop. And he went to a council, the second council of the church, the first what we call ecumenical council, at Nicaea. And there was a man named Arius who tried to say, at one point, Christ never existed. And St. Nicholas got so upset that he stormed down from his seat and he boxed the ears of Arius. We live sadly today in 2022 in the age of memes. And some of the greatest memes you'll ever see is St. Nicholas boxing the ears of Arius because he could not stand to hear heresy preached. And there's this wonderful story. There's even a church dedicated to St. Nicholas. Depending on the translation, St. Nicholas in chains or St. Nicholas in prison in Rome. And if you go to this church, there is a wonderful painting of St. Nicholas hitting Arius. And St. Athanasius was only a deacon at the time, but you see him in the picture along with the patriarch of Alexandria, Alexander, presiding over the council, looking approvingly. <laughs> but as the story goes, St. Nicholas was arrested for hitting Arius. Remember, we, we sometimes fail to realize this. Our laws are based on Roman law. And even in Roman times, in 325, you just couldn't hit somebody. And so St. Nicholas was arrested. And as the story goes, and as my church history professor in seminary would say, if it's not true, it should be. <laughs> I believe it was true, though. Our Lady appeared to St. Nicholas and said, don't worry, you'll be fine. And he was released shortly thereafter, returned to the council, and shortly after that returned to his diocese of, I can never pronounce it correctly, it's either Myra or Mira. Either way, someone on social media is going to tell me I'm pronouncing it wrong when they see this video. And he died shortly thereafter. His cult spread throughout the East and the rest, and from Moscow to the United States, this saint 
despite the fact that he did not found any great order like Francis or Dominic, his cult spread to the point where we kind of know him now as Santa Claus. And as charitable and as wonderful as he is, and he does fit the persona of Santa Claus very well, at least the true Santa Claus, we have to realize that what we saw in St. Nicholas is how our bishops today should act and are not acting. I was removed from ministry by a bishop who was not even a bishop of my diocese, not even a bishop, for six weeks. He simply came in. I was studying in D.C., working on a doctorate in theology. He listened to the vicars who didn't get their way, vicar of clergy and vicar general, who did not get their way under the former bishop, Bishop Doran. And he called me in. He heard my side of the story. I could tell by the way he treated me that the well was already poisoned. And less than a week later, he called me back and he removed me from ministry. He's not a St. Nicholas. And shortly before that, a priest of my diocese, Tim Doherty, was made Bishop of Lafayette in Indiana. And I now know one good friend and one classmate from seminary who have been removed by him. We live in a time where priests cannot stand up and preach the truth. And bishops think that they have carte blanche to go after priests that they do not like. Not the priests that have actually done something wrong, like Monsignor Grinder, Monsignor Burrell, up in the Diocese of La Crosse, who nobody denies he was surfing the gay hookup app Grinder. He was put into ministry after only a year of being out. And we were told by his bishop, who's also Father Altman's bishop, that, well, he's, one of the reasons he's being back in ministry is because he's committed no crime. <laughs> that doesn't mean he should be put back into ministry. And if I ever have the chance to speak to Bishop Callahan, I would like to say to him, well, Father Altman hasn't committed any crime. When are you going to put him back into ministry? But one of the other reasons that we chose St. John the Baptist as our patron is because he's a reminder to us of what priests should always be. Behold, I send my messenger, my angel, before your face, who shall make ready you your way before you. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who shall make ready your way before you. This is what priests must do day in and day out, is to prepare the faithful, all of you, to meet Christ in his kingdom. No liturgical season better represents our life than Advent. Both are short both should be penitential. Both will have their moments of joy. For example, the Feast of St. Nicholas, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. But in the end, it is not about here on earth. It is about the world to come. When we say day in and day out, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. That world that we're speaking about is not this world. It is the world to come. 
And as I finish my talk today, I would like you all to take your St. John Vianney cards. Follow along as I lead you in this prayer, please. O oh, Jesus, I pray for your faithful and fervent priests, for your unfaithful and tepid priests, for your priests laboring at home or abroad in distant mission fields, for your tempted priests, for your lonely and desolate priests, for your young priests, for your dying priests, for the souls of your priests in purgatory. But above all, I recommend to you the priests dearest to me, the priest who baptized me, the priest who absolved me from my sins, the priest at whose masses I assisted and who gave me your body and blood in holy communion, the priest who taught and instructed me, all the priests to whom I am indebted in any other way. O oh, Jesus, keep them all close to your heart and bless them abundantly in time and eternity. Amen. St. John Vianney, patron saint of diocesan priests, pray for us, obtain for us, many and holy priests. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, 2020 was about taking away the priests that baptized you, the priests that anointed you, the priests that gave you Holy Communion, the priests that were there when you were sick. We cannot allow that to happen. This is well beyond politics. This is well beyond of, well, I believe this and you believe this. For the faith to continue, we must realize that we need holy priests. We need bishops who are going to act as St. Nicholas did, who are going to stand up, confront heresy to their face, pray for holy priests, but more importantly, pray for bishops that have a fatherly heart, like St. Nicholas, who will give their lives totally for their flock. Thank you. Yeah, he does. I mean, that's beautiful. Standing ovation. That's beautiful. What a courageous priest. What a courageous priest. My goodness. So before we go to Q&A, and we will have that, we will have that, I want to invite up Matthew Pleasy, who is the author of a book that just got released. He's going to tell you a little bit about that, a little message. Um, in, but before he does that, I, I am calling upon each of you. Today is the feast day of St. Nicholas, and what does this symbolize? This was a very great bishop who saw fit to look at those who were in desperate need and gave a lending hand, did he not? We now have priests who are, as I said, on the front line they need us. They need us. We need them. If we do not support these priests through the Coalition for Cancel Priests, it is game over, folks. We need to support them. Because, you know, as I'd shared in a newsletter, CUP had forged a priestly support committee because I mean, we're having priests canceled right and left in the Diocese of Lafayette. So it's keeping our committee in full mode, full active mode. But the reality is we do not have the core competency and, and, and really the reach that the Coalition for Cancel Priests can do. They can vet these priests to make sure that they suitably should be supported, right? That, that are actually being sidelined. So that's step one. Step two, they not just provide financial assistance, but they're providing what is so critical, which is the spiritual support. I have talked to priests, at least seven now. What is the first thing that happens to these priests? They are treated like pariah. 
from the very brother priests that they have surrounded themselves with in their own diocese. But the coalition comes alongside them and treats them like the brother priest, the fellow, the brotherhood that it should be. Yes. So they are so needed. I, I'm trying to decide if they're like St. John the ba Baptist with a, a hybrid of Mother Teresa. They are guardian angels for these priests. So I'm going to ask you to dig and dig deep. They didn't really talk about it, and I hope it comes up. What are their next steps? What are their big next steps? So that's going to be a question I'm going to ask. But there's going to be a little special gift that's going to be given to donors that Matthew very graciously is going to offer to anybody that makes a $200 donation tonight to the coalition, or even after tonight, to the Coalition for Canceled Priests. David Avignone, Avig, you know, I'm going to get this right. David Avignone, Avignone. Italian. Avignone. 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 I'm going to get it right. They're going to give me a little speech lesson. He's in the back, and he can accept your donations. They've got envelopes on the table as well. Please support these priests. They need this. There's actually no other organization like this. All right, I've committed a three-year, multi-year commitment to the coalition. You know, I hate to say it, but should we really be supporting these bishops and their diocesan efforts if this is the way that they're going to treat priests in this cancel culture? Or should we be redirecting our dollars to an organization like this, right? So just think hard. Think long and hard about this. All right, so I'm going to bring up Matthew Pleasy now. Please join me and welcome him. To start, um, I just want to again thank uh, Father Duvall and thank Father Lovell uh, for coming out here, for speaking with everybody, for all the work they do. Um, not to take up too much time before Q&A, uh, I just wanted to say a few things. Um, and first of all, I wanted to really emphasize the two ways we can support these priests that I really want to emphasize. One, your donations, your support, and two, your fasting. Father Duvall spoke about fasting a little bit, and uh, Father Lovell did as well. And for the past couple of years, I've been able to study the history of fasting and absence for the Roman Catholic Church as well as for the Eastern Church. I write for the Fatima Center for Catholic Family News, for Latin Mass Magazine. Um, I'm the president of catechismclass.com, and, and I write for a number of these places. And one of the things that I'm working to do is to help the faithful rediscover fasting. And something so few people talk about is how we can use fasting as a way to make a difference. We obviously can't hear people's confessions. We can't go around baptizing people. We can't offer mass for people who need it. But we can fast, and we should fast. And we can offer the merits of our fasting for these priests and for other canceled priests and for our family and for the conversion of our society and for our country and for our neighbors. And one of the ways we can do that is by understanding what the saints did. For instance, St. Nicholas, ever since he was a child, he fasted and abstained every single Wednesday and Friday of his entire life. And in fact, it was a requirement in the Roman Catholic Church for over a thousand years that meat uh, and fasting was to be observed on every Wednesday and every Friday of the year, and in many places Saturday as well. In fact, even in our country, in the United States, it wasn't until the 1800s you were allowed as a Catholic to eat meat on Saturdays. This is saying nothing about Fridays. So my work has tried to help rediscover some of this, to make it available for people. And I want you to think about that and pray about that. How can you fast this Advent and offer those fasting for our priests, for their needs, and for the needs of your family and friends? Father talked about Advent, just to say a few words about it. Advent used to be called St. Martin's Lent. 
it was the second Lent of the year. So, Father, I understand why you got it mixed up. I mixed it up to Advent, Lent. It's, it's really the same fast, with just in different degrees. Even St. Thomas in the Summa talks about it's really a different degree of fasting between the two. Traditionally, it lasted for 40 days. It started at least in the year 480. It lasted until at least the 12th century. And St. Charles Borromeo in his own diocese, when he wanted to restore discipline and to help the faithful during a real pandemic and to restore the priests in his diocese, one of the ways he said to do so was to bring back fasting, bring back fasting specifically in Advent. So if you have not been fasting this Advent, now is the time to begin. Especially since tomorrow, the day before Our Lady's Immaculate Conception, was a required, that is an obligatory day of fasting and complete abstinence until the late 1960s. So to rediscover that and to offer those fasting and that absence tomorrow for our priests would be a great way to support them and to thank them and to offer to our Lord a sacrifice in the state of grace for them. So one thing that I wanted to conclude by is to mention that for the past uh, four years, I've been working for Catholic Family News, writing a series of articles for them on uh, the history of the Roman Catechism. That is the Catechism of the Council of Trent. This is one of the most authoritative catechisms ever written. It's not the first. The very first one goes back to 1555 when St. Peter Canisius wrote his catechism as a way to combat the Protestants. And then very soon afterwards, the catechism of St. Pius X, known as the Roman Catechism, or the Catechism of the Council of Trent came out. And that is still the most authoritative catechism in print. But unfortunately, it, it's rather long, it can be difficult to read, and it can be difficult to apply to the real problems we face in our church, in our society, in our nation, and our families today. When I see the great work you guys do, talking about the sanctity of life, or marriage, or natural law, those are covered by the Catechism of the Council of Trent. And what I have sought to do over these series of articles is to explain that Catechism and apply it to our modern world. That series of articles finished up early this year, and I have just now been able to work with a publisher, and that's now available in print. The book is called The Roman Catechism Explained for the Modern World. It launched just this past Saturday, and what I've sought to do is to make it available to people who make a $200 donation tonight, whether it be online at cancelpriest.org or in person, uh, you'll get a copy sent to you. So please see David at the table, or please make a donation online. And we'd love to send you a copy because even if you know the catechism well, gift it to somebody for Christmas. Share the faith with somebody else because what we have is the faith and we know it's the pearl of great price to share it with everybody. So thank a priest and even if, you know, your um, current priest at your parish may be not the most traditional one, give him a copy. He could probably use it. Pray for him. Fast for him. And be sure to pray for our priests today who really need it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. I really appreciate it. Oh, why do I ask you to, to do this? These, these two men, they portray such amazing, abundant cardinal virtues. And what cardinal virtues? The cardinal virtues of fortitude and justice. And we need more like them. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Dominus Fobiscum, Benedictio Dei Omnipotentius Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Descendus Super Vos Mani et Semper. Amen. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.